welcome to the caravan show where we discuss all things caravans that's right everything you need to know about caravans from weights towing maintenance appliances renovations buying a caravan repairs destinations and reviews we'll also chat with some aussie legends manufacturers suppliers and of course people who love caravans take it away Roy. Hey everyone, it's Roy this here from the Caravan Podcast Show. We've got a special guest here with me this morning, Chris Carrigan. Now, Chris Carrigan is from Lithium Battery Systems. Um, Chris, welcome on board. Oh, thanks, Roy. Um, Chris, um, we're going to ask you a few questions about uh, you and your, your company this morning. And um, uh, I know that in my own personal business, we use your services. So, you know, you and I are both known to each other. How long have you been involved with, uh, with battery systems? Uh, for six years. Uh, but prior to that, our CTO was one of these mad uh, kooks who went out and built himself an electric vehicle, so some three or four years before that. But as a group, we've been together six years. So you say group, you're in business with other people? Yeah, there's three of us. Three engineers got together. Uh, one dual mechatronic electrical engineer with a, two chemical engineers got together. That's the three of us who, who own the business. Okay, chemical engineer. I mean, when people think about batteries, I guess they don't normally think chemical engineering, but... Um, Batteries is a chemical process, isn't it? It's that, and I think you know the discipline of engineering is about uh, defining problems and solving them. And prior to that, in fact, my uh, main career has been in the networking industry. I was with a big American company called Cisco for twenty years. So oh wow, Cisco Systems is well known. It's yeah, a, I was it a senior huge. manager at Cisco, and um, so yeah, you know, that was good discipline coming from a big company because so, you know there was a lot of lessons to be learned from you know, working for a big company. Um, and the synergy is good. We've got a very, very strong CTO, a very strong technically focused sort of guy, and I'm out talking to people and um, gathering problems and bringing them back to the company to, to solve. Yeah, so you're actually a local business here in Brisbane. Yes. So you're, you're fully Australian um, run, funded, operated, owned, um, and manufacturing Australian products. I mean, they keep telling us we can't produce products in Australia. But that's absolute nonsense. I mean, uh, you and I are actually living proof that you can do it. Mm. Um, sometimes made difficult by uh, rules and regulations that seem a little bit outdated or a bit silly, but it, it's it's clearly able to do it. And my experience with lithium batteries is you produce a particularly good product. But how did you come about coming up with the product that you're putting into the market today? Through a lot of feedback and engagement with the market, uh, in the early days there were lessons that we didn't know that we didn't know and ne- needed to be learned. And so, in fact, it's companies like yours that gave us the the uh, you know the, the stumbling points to go back and you know, group together and work how we you know um, integrate that into the into the product. One big decision we made was yeah, locally manufacture, but ostensibly make a product which is software driven. So in our uh, top end batteries which get used in Sunland vans, there's some 10,000 lines of code. Now, you'd wonder why you'd put that much software into a battery. Well, that defines the way that battery behaves at all sorts of points in its cycle. So we've got total control over the behaviour of our batteries. And writing every line of that code, we totally know what we need to do when something doesn't behave you know, as we expect or what's needed. And so it's a um, it's a good way to control a complex system like a, like a battery system. So was this possible with other battery types? I mean, could you have done this with glass mat and AGM batteries and so forth? It could be. The thing with lithium is that amazing power needs management. You've got all this dense energy there, and so BMSs are required for the safety of, um, of lithium batteries. And the way we thought about it was, since we're solving a complex power engineering problem... Uh, why not take that and turn that negative, if you like, into an advantage? So make a product that needed that electronics, but turn those electronics around and make them more useful, which is why you know, we've built in, for example, uh, solar controllers and DC-DC controllers and the ability to, you know, four internal shunts, all these external elements. Why? Because we had most of the electronics in there already. Sure. So, for the sake of my listeners, so there's some terminologies that you've used there that apologies is, is, for that. It, no, it's, well, it's common for, for people within your industry because they know exactly what you're talking about. But my listeners may be a little bit confused by that. So, BMS is battery management system. Battery management system. So yes. that manages how the battery charges and how it discharges and how much you can put in it and how much you can take out of it. That that that's correct. Yeah. 
what it's doing is essentially taking individual cells that are put together and making them perform as a safe overall pack. So the lithium battery itself, how is that so different to um, the normal chemical batteries that we've referred to, acid lead batteries or the gel batteries we know? Um, how is this different in the way it operates and produces electricity? Yeah, the, uh, the world's been served very well by the, the, the battery technology of lead acid and it evolved into, you know, from wet cells into AGMs, which was essentially solving the problem of having a, uh, you know, a, a liquid sloshing around inside a battery by putting that acid into a uh, into a gel-like material, and that made them better. But one problem did exist, and uh, and that was the weight. Based on lead, they're very very heavy. And another problem existed in that was vented hydrogen, so they had a bit of an issue with venting and uh, you know, where they were physically placed. And the it whilst in transition, the chemical interaction of the charge and discharge process in a lead acid type cell means that they degrade and they degrade quite badly if they get heavily discharged. And we've all had this experience with uh, batteries in the past. So one or two accidents with a lead acid type battery results in the chemistry being severely altered. And that battery is never the same. And quite often half a dozen of those types of events can render that type of chemistry inoperable going forward. So the... Uh, the the acid lead battery would in fact uh, fail a lot easier than than the failure rate on a lithium battery. Lead acid batteries are, f- are fantastic if weight's not a problem and they're operated in that top fifty percentile range. So use carefully; they're a fantastic solution to to batteries. But of course, you, as you've said, that they're, they're quite weighty, but they're also a lot cheaper too than, than lithium systems. They are they are a lot cheaper, but there's one. Uh, but the as I say, that degradation of the chemistry internally means that they've got a limited cycle life. So you typically get AGM, the better AGMs, with a cycle life of 500 to 1,000 cycles, whereas with lithium you can enjoy somewhere between 2,000 up to 5,000, depending on how they work. By cycle you mean the charge and discharge? Yeah, cycle yeah. is a, yeah, a, a charge and a discharge event. So you'd expect the life expectancy of a lithium battery to be on average... What sort of percentage over that of an acid? It can be three to five times more life cycle. Yeah, well, that simply um, obviously has a big impact on the value of the battery because the lithium batteries are also um, a lot more expensive than acid lead. But if you're not having to replace them as frequently, yeah. uh, as frequently rather, then um, maybe that price difference is actually sort of stunned away by the fact you don't have to keep replacing it. Yeah, well, in big business, there's a common terminology which is called TCO, or Total Cost of Ownership. And you look at the, any device that's used in a corp- big corporation and you go, well, what does it cost me to run this thing for 10 years or for extended periods of time? So the capital outlay at the front is not really the whole equation. If you need to, over the you know, life cycle of a, a van, which is, and your vans are well into the decades, you know, every two to three or four years having to rip out batteries and replace them, if you took a 10-year view, by the time you're onto your second cycle of doing that, you're in front with lithium. So we've, we've, we've really got a parity when it comes to, to pricing, perhaps, uh, may even tip into the lithium favour. But, of course, the big issue is the weight difference. Yes. So as a percentage, how much lighter would a lithium battery be over an acid lead battery? Yes, yeah, a good question. We've done jobs where we've ripped out a quarter of a tonne out of big boats and out of caravans, one or 200 kilograms, a rough rule of thumb, and it's d- difficult to directly compare, but it can be up to a third or a quarter of the weight. And that really kicked in recently because... People expect a lot more out of their caravans these days and they don't like to suffer the heat at night time. So air conditioning has become a big useful appliance that you know, is required and it's, it's not glamping as such, it's just keeping comfortable, you know. And people want a coffee machine in the morning and previously to get the type of uh, power in AGM, it just wasn't possible with the weight restrictions. You were talking about, you know, three, four, five hundred kilograms of battery. And now that is, it can be achieved with lithium in sort of 60 or 90 kilograms. Yeah, so we can put batteries in there, we can run the inverter in it to convert it from 12 to 240, so we can run 240 yep. appliances like air conditioners and coffee machines and so forth yep. in a more affordable fashion because when it comes to the weight elements, we're able to put enough battery power in there yep. to be able to achieve that, where with acid-lead batteries, the number of batteries that required would make the weight um, really 
too heavy to, to make it even a, a, a realistic possibility, wouldn't it? That's exactly right. And going back to that original point we were discussing, because you need to operate them in that top 50% oil range to properly calculate the AGM-type battery requirements for that type of usage, you need to double the amount of capacity. Otherwise, you accidentally leave the air conditioning on one night and a couple of lights on the fridge door open, you completely deaden the batteries, you wake up and you've got a severely chemically affected battery that's never going to be as good and you do that a handful of times and you're back to the workshop for a replacement. Of course we talk about um, acid lead and we, we there are various different types of acid lead and we, we talked AGM which is a, uh, the glass mat um, batteries and there are other different types of those but the same thing applies with the lithium batteries as well doesn't it? That, that's not all lithiums aren't the same. No, there right. are different types. And one of the things that lithium has copped over uh, over the last, well, decade or more is people's concern of the ability for lithium bar- uh, batteries to, well, explode. Um, but that's it. Yeah. Can you explain why the ones that we're using or the ones you build mm. are not likely to go bang in the middle of the night and blow people out of their caravans? Yeah, no, that's right. And that was one of our primary uh, engineering problems to solve with safety at the beginning, right? Roughly speaking, there's, uh, there's three or four different t- uh, categories of lithium battery. The cheaper fully imported devices commonly use a device called an 18650, which is a, essentially like a big AA battery, and they put those into mass arrays, right? And that's the way that they make a battery. You, a lot of problems there with um, the spot welding that joins them all up. You've got hundreds of internal connections, and the likelihood of having a cross connection go wrong as that type of battery is vibrated is relatively high. So not a particularly safe option for you know, the caravanning or the mobile environment. Another way to get lithium cells is to get what they call soft pouch, and that's what they use in phones, actually, because they use the, the plastic casing of the phone to form the mechanical substrate to keep it nice and rigid. And uh, you know, all those problems you see with phones have problems where someone's sent, you know, basically sat on it or mechanically compromised it by twisting it. What we've gone for is the safest option, which is what they call hard case prismatic. And again, there's two categories in that area too. There's the softer, cheaper plastics and there's the ones that have actually have the hard case, which is a metal, aluminium actually. So it's a totally rigid aluminium uh, cell internally that presents a very uh, structured M8 bolt. That, you know, that's the way that they're connected up together. So very, uh, you know, a very small number of very strong, rigid connections. So being mechanically compromised, all that... Uh, explosive loss of energy we, that you see for the very catastrophic events with lithium are usually when the anode and the cathode get mechanically compromised because they've been crushed or you know distorted or drilled into or hit or something like that. So basically you're saying that unless there is a, um, a mechanical damage somehow that they're not just going to suddenly start to blow up and... It, it, that really does need some sort of impact, which, quite frankly, was the same as acid lead. Um, you know, I've actually personally seen an acid lead battery explode. So mm. under the right conditions, and, and that wasn't mechanical impact, by the way, that was overcharging that actually caused one to, to build up. It was a sealed battery and it just built up, the gases built up inside and the battery literally went bang. Mm. So um, I, I've seen that, you know, even those type of batteries can do it. The other thing with lithium batteries as opposed to AGM is AGMs, uh, don't require any special type of charging um, parameters that you can sort of just pretty much charge it with with almost anything, just pump lots of power in there. Not the case with lithium. You do need to manage it correctly, don't you? And that's what the BMS does. Um, a lot of the multi-stage charges that evolved over the long period the lead-acid batteries have been in the market were to solve some of the chemical issues like sulfurcation of the uh, plates inside a battery so, and the fact that they require a float to, and at that float point they're dissipating hydrogen and that's the chemically the best way to make a lead acid battery long, last a long time. So this um, desulfurcation, this having float and, um, and bulk charging rates, so yeah, three and five and seven stage charges are, are a legacy of an electrical way to solve the chemical underlying uh, characteristics of an AGM battery. Uh, Lithium batteries, a lot of that electrical um, work is done by the BMS. So in fact with our batteries, a simple single single stage uh, charger is is all it needs because the BMS will work out whether the voltage is too high, whether the the amps are too high and 
it's got about 20 different error conditions it's looking for, including those that could present at the charging time, and it essentially looks after it. So what you're saying is correct, but in fact, there's a lot of fud out there about the, um, you know, the, the complexity required for lithium chargers, and with ours, for example, uh, pretty much uh, any charger that's in the right voltage range will work, and uh, the BMS will ensure that it's safely protected. So, yeah, it comes back to the point of, of having this BMS. And what you've done, um, which I haven't seen elsewhere, is you've actually made that as part of the battery. So you've got a battery where I can just literally plug power, unregulated power straight into um, the battery using a very simple Anderson-type connection, and it will then regulate that and charge the battery. And you're also able to do that with different types because you're using an MPPT controller um, so you're able to use different powers from different sources is that right yes yeah our top of the range battery which you've got has got what it's called the BIC it's got built-in controllers and um, the big, this biggest change in our BMS from the first generation of lithium uh, BMSs that we're about where instead of using big heavy semi-mechanical relays called contactors we use what we call FETs which are a so, uh, which fill the solid transistors which are a solid state device and so they control the power going in and out, but they dissipate a lot of heat. And uh, we were lucky, and people uh, say that the government doesn't support R&D. In our case, they've been very supportive. We, we enjoyed, um, in our research uh, phase, uh, good tax deductions, and we had some 12 university students because the FETs have got an amazing advantage, but you've got heat that you have to dissipate. And the way we solved that problem, and it was quite tricky, was to dissipate that heat into the outer enclosure of the aluminium case that makes up the overall package of the battery and you would think that would sounds like it's simple but the thermal plating and the way that you conduct that thermal uh, energy into the overall and when we got it right it's like throwing a bucket of hot water into the ocean and but you get a washer in place or something that's not quite right and it doesn't work right so and again going back and and uh, talking about you know the safety aspect of it we found this really uh, easy way to dissipate the heat and then it added to the mechanical protection of the battery. So it's one of those great engineering problems where two things could, yep. two problems could be solved yep. with one. And yeah, and in Australians actually, it's not cheaper to import folded aluminium. So our aluminium's made across the road from where we are in the south of Brisbane. And yeah, you know, it, everyone's got the temptation to seek overseas supplies, but we do, we're very good at that type of manufacturing. So there was no cost disadvantage there. So it ended up being a triple win for us, you know. Cost was good. We solved the heat dissipation problem, and we created a tougher outer enclosure for the battery. Yeah, I mean, this is another thing we don't realise when people talk about buying overseas product as opposed to buying Australian, uh, and they say you know the, the imports are so much cheaper. But there's a reason for that. Actually, um, my experience and from what I've seen is that Australian-made products are generally actually better products. Now, that there's always examples when that's not going to be the case. But generally speaking, it is the case. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be part of that overall picture of Australian manufacturing. Now, just going back to, I, I'm, I've got a caravan out there. I'm one of my listeners out there. And they're thinking, well, you know, my, my acid-lead battery is about to give up on me. Um, I'm thinking that I need a bit more power because, you know, I'm going to put a new air conditioner in or I'm going to add some additional electrical stuff and I need more power. Um, Times to, to replace my batteries, you know, and I've got an acid lead system in there, but if I change it to a lithium battery, I can't just take that battery out and put a lithium battery in there um, because the other things I need, like my regulators and solar controllers and all that, has to be changed as well. So it puts people off because they see it as actually being a, a big issue. But in reality, if they go for the right type of system, it's relatively simple, isn't it? Yes, there's two, two points there. At the time of building like you, you were doing in, in a clean sheet of paper, those integrated charges make a lot of sense. It's less, less labour, it's more efficient, it's, it's an overall better system, right? But if you're sitting there with a situation where you've got all those elements in place, it's more efficient cost-wise to consider going for the lower range of the lithium batteries. And yes, they are direct um, replacement. You can take the old um, AGM-style batteries out and... Now, the thing about lithium is it does sit at a slightly higher voltage, but it's well within the acceptable window for all 12-volt appliances. And, in fact, that slightly higher voltage ends up being an advantage um, throughout because 
uh, you know, watts, which are the power that something uh, consumes, is a is a mathematical. You know, a, it's volts times amps. So if the voltage is slightly higher, you're always drawing less amps. So long story short, and excuse me, I always ramble on when it gets into engineering topics. But bottom line is direct replacement in, and the whole thing's running a little bit cooler anyway because it's slightly higher voltage, and there's no change as far as any of your appliances are concerned. All they see is what looks like to them fully charged AGM battery. So um, with the lithium battery system, we've, we've now replaced it. Uh, we've gone for one that's got the um, regulator uh, um, or BMS built into it. But we need to make sure that we've got the right to suit everything else that's in there. So, you know, I've got um, currently in my van in this scenario a 100 AGM. Mm. And so I'm going to replace that with a 100 lithium battery so my battery charger is suitable but if i was to go from say 100 to fitting 200 of lithium i am going to need to increase my charges capacity aren't i the charging capacity would be is really more a rate of time so it's just how quickly how quickly yeah yeah so it's not that a you know if i've got a 15 amp charger in there and i want to go for say 35 amp it's not actually anything other than how long it takes to re-energise my battery, mm. it's just a question of how... Yeah, it's a question of how long that it's going to take to do that, isn't it? Mm, that's right, yeah. yeah. So you, you can, in fact, do it. One of the stories that I've been listening to for a long time, and, and, and it's always a confusing thing for me, is people say if you've got a 100 AGM and you replace it with a 100 lithium battery, it's almost the equivalent to 200 of AGM in the way that it works. And I've never really been able to explain that to people properly. Perhaps... Um, you can put on your your yeah. hat again and explain why that is in fact the case. A 100 lithium is the equivalent to, to running a 200 AGM. That's mopping up that ratio that we, d- we were discussing before, which is to operate an AGM system, all the engineers who designed it meant it to operate in the top 50% off. So in a 100 amp hour AGM battery, you really have 50 amp hours of usable capacity. In a lithium battery, they were designed to be the depth of discharge right down to 10%, so they can operate right down to the 10% full or the 90% depth of discharge. So there's a common ratio which is used, which is that 9 over 5. And that's assuming that you're operating both of those batteries the way that the manufacturer intended. So in reality, they do have similar capacity, but the lithium is sitting there with not double, just a little bit under double, usable capacity if operated correctly now you can operate an agm battery down into that second half of its you know, below the 50 percent on mark but that goes back to that point you us you are compromising the chemistry the, the, uh, so you'll never if you keep running it at those rates you'll never get back up to 100 percent. Right. you'll slowly diminish it and diminish it and diminish it until it, it literally no yeah. long no longer has the ability to charge itself again exactly right right yeah. okay yeah. so um I'm looking at uh, putting in this 200 lithium battery system. I've arguably got almost twice the power if I've gone for the same size. Um, I've reduced the weight by maybe up to two-thirds of, of the weight. Um, I'm just wondering what the downside size is of running a lithium battery over an AGM. Is, is it a bigger box? No, look, every physical aspect of... An electrical aspect is uh, lithium's a winner. The only holdback has always been the price, and the price was all about that discussion we had about total cost of ownership. Uh, in this industry, it's about every two years there's a bit of a step change and the you know the increases or the betterment of the technology, and we've just gone through one of those now. So all, the, and in fact, you know, to make that total cost of ownership worthwhile, it really has only been about a year. So when you transitioned to lithium was probably about the right time because prior to that, although lithium was fantastic and offered advantages, it was still a bit more than... Yeah, like, like, mo- like most things, these prices are constantly coming down as as the more products come into the market, the demand increases, so there's more, there's more uh, manufacturing, the cost of manufacturing diminishes because of it, so they become more affordable as time goes on anyway, don't they? Mm. So that, uh, that transition point, I think, was about a year ago. So these days now, it is it is economically more viable to go lithium as well. So in fact, all pointers are going to it. That's why there's a massive surge across the board 
know, yeah, like it. like most things, um, people are now talking about, uh, and I've and I've read some things recently that lithium may in fact be on the way out, and there's a new technology, new, um, which is called. Um, I'm trying to remember what they call this new crystal. Uh, crystal. Oh, oh, the lead crystal? Lead crystal, yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah, which was a fantastic advancement, actually. In the, um, it, it was the tail end of the lead acid uh, you know, type of chemistry, and it solved that problem of going beyond the 50% old mark. So lead crystal batteries are fantastic as far as they can go right down to the 10 or 20%. So it's actually similar to lithium in that regard. So there's a parity in, in its operation to lithium? In electrical operation. What about weight? That's, they couldn't get that shackle of the lead off their back, so they still are and still have that weight problem. Okay. So they're still three and, times and, the weight. And pricing? Pricing's pretty good too. So they're a reasonable price. They're a reasonable price. Um, they, they are better in terms of what you can get out of the battery, um, but they're still a, a really heavy battery. And I don't know about availability. I, I'm not seeing them on the shelves all over the place. Well, the market was sullied in the early days because it... it it was difficult to tell whether they were, in fact, a really good VRLA AGM type battery. So the absolute latest AGM batteries in lead crystal were a little bit diff- hard to tell apart. And a lot of the unscrupulous importers in those days, where they were fully imported, were basically substituting the two and the market couldn't really test them. So its name got sullied. It didn't solve the weight problems. And it hasn't really had the grasp, which is a shame from an engineering point of view because it was a very acceptable solution to the lead problem but then again do you keep solving the problem for lead because it's got a history or is it time to you move on to new technology yeah of course I'm i mean we've got i've noticed then we've both got these almost matching um watches that are run on the same technology that, that we're talking about there are lithium uh, battery system mm. and our telephones are run on lithium batteries so lithium's lithium's really with us and it's going to be here uh, to stay by the looks of it so lithium is Probably the way that everyone, if they haven't gone that way already, then they certainly should be going that way in the future. And it's great, again, as you say, that we're, we're doing so much with that in our local products and that we're building these things locally. So is there any reason why someone shouldn't go out there and, and change their existing battery system to, to a lithium? I don't think so. I mean, legitimately, I don't think so. One of the other things that when we are talking previously about um, having battery systems where we can run air conditioners or coffee machines or any of these high-power 240 volt appliances, we're running them through um, inverter systems. Mm. The only problem that I said is we really haven't caught up with how to get that energy back into the battery when we're pulling it out at such vast rates as we do with a with an inverter. That is to say, unless you've got a whole um, array of solar panels up there, you're going to need shore power at some stage, but be it um, generator or, or um, 240-volt inlets. Do you think that the technology is going to improve with the ability to get more power into these batteries via that type of system? And the, we keep watching carefully the solar market, and the solar market, um, because it's watched so carefully, we don't, haven't appreciated the, ch- the incremental changes that it's made, but they've been vast. Uh, every there's, a, there's always in these types of markets a, a sweet spot, which is this, this intersection of, of cost and you know, functionality. You can always buy technology that only NASA use, but it's you know, so expensive it's unusable, really. And there's the stuff that's old, so it's very, very cheap. But it was panels, for example, that sweet spot in the house panel arena is around the 325 to 350 watt mark. So in the past, only a year ago, a 1.6 metre by 1 metre solar panel in the market for the best price you could do was about a 250 watt. Now it's sort of 325, 350. So that's slowly coming in the right direction. Yeah, in our case, in the caravan industry, um, unlike the housing industry, footprint, the actual yeah. panel size is really critical. So we're looking for the smallest panel we can get with the highest output we can possibly get yeah. with the most efficient rate uh, ratio that we can possibly get and we are being fed with lots of different panels nowadays and some of them are good, some of them are sold very well but really perhaps not as good as, as we'd like them to see. Uh, I don't know, if, if, are we building solar panels in Australia yet? No, unfortunately not and the, and the volume is so low comparatively. Um, there's a lot of, uh, it's a very, very competitive market. There's European suppliers, US suppliers, Chinese suppliers. It's a little. Um, it, there's not too much bad material around. It's uh, it, it seems to all be relatively good now. Uh, so the gap is closed between the f- 
tier one and the first class type of product and the cheaper product. So um, it comes down now to my suggestion, just as a really rough sort of thing with caravan um, users, would be to talk with your builders and consider as many panels as possible. Yeah, and they really, people should be talking to the manufacturers about this. And of course, the manufacturers should be talking to people like yourself to make sure that they're actually fitting the right gear into the caravans for their customers. And they need to be, I mean, as a, if I put my other hat on as a caravan manufacturer, I've, I've got to say, it's getting increasingly difficult. Um, in, in, you know, the last 20 years, we've gone from building caravans to now building caravans with you know, air conditioning systems as standard, radios, TVs, um, hot water services, um, different types of suspensions, and now, of course, these whole electronics things of using different battery systems and solar panels and satellite systems. We've now having to become experts on just about everything. We can't just be um, building a caravan where it's got, you know, a bed and a seat and a table in there and you put it on a chassis with some wheels and people... Up, up, off they go. They want more water, they want water pumps, electric pumps. They're not happy to do pump them by hand anymore. So the electrical side of what's been happening with people like yourself producing better and better batteries are the sort of things that are allowing these other technologies to be introduced and used in our caravans. And we as manufacturers have to become experts on this subject, not just um, relying on the general public to learn it themselves. And you've got a... You know, a very complicated job in front of you and hats off to the industry and including Sunland because you're juggling venting for air conditioners and juggling roof space for other utilities that you, you do need to do and the, of course the electrical guys are saying we want panels everywhere and the other guys are saying look I've got to get some fumes out of here so I need a vent up there as well. Oh and there's all the compliance and because we, there are laws um, that prevent or, or, or stop us from doing certain things because this item needs that, that item needs something different. And, of course, the general public just want it all to work at the end of the day, so we're expected and we need to know. And the point is, though, for manufacturers that are out there, is that there are experts like yourself that can, can genuinely come on board and help them and show them how to do this sort of stuff rather than just you know thinking, well, all I need to do is throw a battery in here. Well, let's learn and let's educate ourselves better how we can serve the public um, better by using, I say, local experts with uh, with local products. Mm. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here this morning and, as usual, you're full of information. Um, oh, I'm sorry, just one thing I've got to ask. Um, given the fact that lithiums do last longer than AGM batteries, what sort of warranty do you put on your batteries? We've got a standard three-year warranty, but... With Sunland, because we know and have worked closely and have a good understanding of the operating environment they're going into and know that the settings for their use has been adhered to in a good engineering sense, we're happy to provide a five-year warranty, but only via Sunland installed vans. Okay, so but it, I'm, I'm another manufacturer out there. Um, you know, Our podcast isn't about my particular company. This is for everyone. So I, I've got another company out there, um, and I'm going to, you know, talk to LBS and say, LBS, can you come in and help us and, and so forth, you're going to provide them with a same type of warranty as you do with us. So if they come through you where the technology is learnt, uh, your expertise is put on board, we can then have a five-year warranty offering to those manufacturers for their battery systems, where at the moment uh, a lot of them might only have a 12-month with what they're currently using. So another reason why other manufacturers should be talking to the likes of LBS. And to those people, I know that... Mostly my listeners out there are users, but for you as uh, as caravanners, going to manufacturers that are using the right type of system is also a really important thing. So, you know, we want to endorse that all manufacturers and all customers get exactly what they should and the warranty is a, is a major part of that. So, yeah, no, thank you for that, uh, Chris. So again, as I say, um, Chris, thank you for coming in today. Thank you for spending your time and explaining some of those things. Um, I feel better educated and I'm sure our listeners feel better educated by it. So, you know, see you on the flip side, mate. Yeah, and thanks, thanks so much for the opportunity. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Chris.